Hi, this is Daniela Camboni, and I just had the pleasure of emceeing the Stansberry Conference and Alliance meeting in Las Vegas. It's our most successful conference for investors and Alliance members to date. All of the Stansberry editors were there propelling conversations forward alongside our keynote speakers, Mohamed al and Grant Williams, and my longtime friend and gold bug, John Duty. The Stansberry Alliance Conference is an event I look forward to every year. And for a limited time, you have access to watch the live stream from last week's presentations with free ticker recommendations and panel conversations among the smartest analysts I know and more. So you still have time to be in the room with these folks and me by purchasing a live stream ticket. Visit dannylivestream.com. That's danny, D-A-N-I, livestream.com to gain access now. We hope you don't miss this chance. See you soon. Hi, this is Daniela Camboni, and welcome back to StansberryInvestor.com. We are continuing a very important conversation with our guest today. Please welcome back Rick Rule, formerly of Sprott, now uh, the, the head and founder of Rule Investment Media. Rick, always good to see you. Always a pleasure, Daniela. We've been having wonderful conversations for almost two decades now. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. One home run after the, the next. And I thought, okay, the folks at home thoroughly enjoyed our last conversation at in, on inflation. Uh, let's pick it up from there because the drama continues. Uh, and now a Fed vice chair uh, coming out saying another year of inflation like this one would not be a policy success. He conceded inflation is running at much more than a moderate overshoot of the central bank's 2% target. <laughs> and if the current pace continues into next year, that would not be considered a policy success. Surprise, surprise, Rick Rule. What do you make of this saga that keeps unfolding? Policy success. I'm searching my memory, Daniela. And as a thought experiment, I would urge your listeners to search their memories and see if in their lifetime they remember a single policy success coming from the big thinkers. Mm -hmm. The idea that we have this board of economic advisors and all these various boards that we pay hundreds of millions of dollars to, all considered they should listen to your show for a couple of years. They could save a couple hundred million dollars and they might actually come up with a policy success. You know, <laughs> anybody who shops, anybody who has bought gasoline, anybody who has been to Costco, anybody who's gone to a corner store or maybe younger people who have ordered from Amazon don't need to be told by the big thinkers prices are rising. The idea that there is a huge discussion around the fact that the big thinkers in the world who don't probably shop for their own groceries have finally figured out that there is wage and price inflation, uh, I think is laughable to anybody who has been on the streets for the last 18 months. Uh, I, you know, I have to agree with you, Rick, and, you know, maybe you can help us make sense of this inflation talk because we hear a lot of jargon and terms being thrown. Hyperinflation, superinflation, stagflation. What is it? Which stage are we at? What would you call? Uh, probably depends on you know who you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Like the old saw about a recession is when your neighbor was laid off and a depression is when you were laid off. So I think we need to personalize. Uh, we, we need to personalize. Uh, all of these things. Stagflation, I think, is a circumstance where you have a stagnant economy, which is to say high unemployment and inflation. I don't think we're in stagflation. Uh, I, I think this economy is relatively strong. I don't think the underpinnings are strong. I think the strength in this economy is due to artificially low interest rates and too much liquidity. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think we have a fairly strong economy. If one looks at unemployment and one looks at um, demand pull inflation, uh, which is one form of inflation that we're experiencing, uh, certainly you couldn't call the certain environment stagflation. I suspect, get Daniela, and I'm not an economist, as you know, uh, I suspect that if we did have an economic slowdown, that the policy response to that would be yet more artificial liquidity. And we might involve or evolve, pardon me, into stagflation. But calling what we have now uh, an economy where there's a shortage of workers, an economy 
that is characterized by excess liquidity uh, throughout the economy, calling that stagflation uh, is problematic. But ignoring the fact that we're having inflation, one would expect to one would expect the big thinkers to ignore that we're having inflation. But for the people who are listening for your show, uh, the people who are planning for their future, their family's future, the people who are trying to invest, the people who are trying to defend their purchasing power right. for the next five years, really truly need to consider the personal implications of the big thinkers' policies. I think that's critical. No one can deny the landscape has changed. You said anyone who's basic, basically breathing, living, realizes the higher prices are here. I was in Las Vegas for the big Stansbury conference, you know, last week, and all the billboards for these hotels with incentives, a thousand dollar signing bonus because there's a shortage of cleaning staff, restaurant workers. I mean, when was the last time we've seen this, Rick? Right. Mm -hmm. And and like you said, so anyone who's who's breathing sees the higher prices, sees the empty shelves. We're not even able to get a lot of goods off of, you know, Amazon or Fresh Direct. Out, of, you know, it says shortage for now, come back later or whatnot. So inflation, would you not agree, is definitely in running through the veins of the system right now, fully running. I think that's absolutely correct. I think it's absolutely correct. There, there are some items of inflation that may be transitory. Uh, energy costs are up among other things, because they were so low. <laughs> you know, when oil was at $20 a barrel, when it cost the industry 65 to make it, of course, you were going to, to uh, create a shortage. Some aspects of inflation probably do self-correct. Remember, in earlier conversations, Daniela, around the fundamentals in resource industries, we've always said that markets, while they're messy, work. And the cure for high prices is often high prices. So in certain circumstances, uh, as an example, increasing food prices has to do with as much with how low food prices were three years ago as how high they are today. But other forms of inflation, other causes of inflation have been in place for five or six years. We're just starting to recognize the effect of policies. We've enumerated them before on your show, quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. That's debasing the currency. It's counterfeiting. Uh, artificially low interest rates. There are causes to inflation, and those causes for inflation are incredibly popular politically. So it is more likely than not, although not certain, that the causes of the style of inflation that we're seeing today won't change. Artificially low interest rates. Goldman Sachs has come out saying the era of low interest rates is coming to an end. We keep hearing talk, the Fed will be turning more hawkish. So my question to you is, uh, where would you be likely to place your bets, Rick? Do you think we're gonna see higher interest rates, which we keep hearing about, or a major stock market correction? The other thing we keep hearing. I think they're gonna to try to raise interest rates. Uh, they have to. They, they need to put in place policy tools so that when the inevitable slowdown comes, they'll have a policy response. And the only policy response they seem to know is uh, excessive credit and artificially low interest rates. So I, I think that the big thinkers of the world very much would like to see higher interest rates if for no other reason than to give them a tool <laughs> to lower them. Uh, and I don't in the very near term see a stock market crash. Uh, Stansbury's own Steve Sugarroot, mm -hmm. I think gave a, a pretty good discussion of that in Las Vegas where he suggested that a circumstance where equities prices are rising and where there's lots of cash on the sideline in a strong economy is not a recipe for a stock market crash. Uh, in fact, uh, I will argue if given the opportunity later in the show that one of the constraints to gold in an inflationary environment seems to be the belief among ordinary investors that there's enough pricing power in the S&P 500 that equities themselves are an inflation hedge. Uh, a circumstance where there's excessive liquidity in the markets, where the yield on savings products is very low, which increases the yield, the perception of yield from dividends, uh, and an inflationary environment where at least some companies have pricing power would suggest that in the very near term, at least, uh, a collapse in general equities markets would appear to be unlikely. Uh, again, with the caveat that I'm a credit analyst, I'm not an economist. Uh, let let's talk about that then 
because with, you know, for the longest time, we've heard, well, gold is the ultimate inflation hedge. Then Rick Rule, you may be the only person that could answer this. Why hasn't that been reflected in the gold price yet? Uh, that's, a, that's a subject for a later interview, Daniela. Notice how I set you up for that very, very carefully. Uh, if one examines uh, the history of precious metals and precious metals bull markets going back 60 years, as you know, I always refer to the Barron's Gold Mining Index. Yes. Uh, what you'll see is that circumstances like this are normal and natural. Just as the backdrop to create the inflation that we're enjoying today, if that's the right word, uh, has been uh, put in place over six or seven years, there's a delay. We're beginning to see, we're beginning to experience inflation now. And the behaviors that are inspired by inflation are something that we're going to see in the future. Remember, Daniela, that the last 40 or 45 years have been really Goldilocks situations yeah. with declining inflation, declining interest rates, declining real interest rates. Right. That party, from my point of view, is coming to an end. But the behaviors that were occasioned by the circumstance that we experienced for the last 45 years don't change on a dime. And is that a concern to you from what I'm hearing it is because you say, look, we feel the effects of inflation. Anyone, like you said, is breathing, feels it. Um, but because we've been so accustomed to living in not inflationary times, we don't know what to do in this situation. So how much of a concern is that to you for the, for the ordinary folks out there? For the ordinary folks, I'm extremely concerned. Uh, for myself, a veteran speculator, uh, this is a circumstance made in heaven. Uh, I see several things that to me are at least extraordinary probabilities that nobody else cares about. Uh, the idea that the gold price is constrained and rage bound in the near term, when every circumstance that traditionally has taken the gold price higher is in place, means that bets that I make right now on gold equities when the market doesn't seem to care uh, are likely to pay off for me in the future. So from my own circumstance, uh, it couldn't be better. I, I would have a very difficult time scripting a, a circumstance that was better for me personally. For uh, people who haven't been as lucky in life and people who haven't spent as much time understanding the economic ramifications of policy, people who are less able and less prepared, uh, I'm obviously very concerned for those people. I'm, you know, concerned about somebody who doesn't have the skill set to uh, feed his or her family uh, yeah. in an economy where compensation is increasingly tied to utility. If you don't have any utility, you don't enjoy any compensation. And clearly, that's an ugly place to be in a time of inflation. So being concerned for the citizenry, while at the same time, uh, appreciating the opportunity afforded me personally, uh, you know, that contradiction is fairly obvious to me. So what are your thoughts when, you know, and we've heard this how many times now that, well, Bitcoin has replaced gold as that ultimate inflation hedge. Like, yeah, gold worked in the 1970s. That was great. But Bitcoin's here now and Bitcoin is digital gold. Is it digital gold? No. Uh, gold has utility in and of itself. The utility around Bitcoin uh, is, first of all, the network, uh, which is still substantially smaller than gold. I, I, I note that the market cap of all digital currencies just recently exceeded $3 trillion, while the market cap for gold worldwide, not including silver, exceeds $11 trillion. So even in terms of the network aspect, Gold uh, enjoys three times the network that Bitcoin does. Importantly, though, I see them as complementary asset classes. Remember that the total market capitalization of both assets combined is $14 trillion, where the market capitalization of total savings and investment assets worldwide is $650 trillion. In the words of our mutual friend, Robert Friedland, both assets combined uh, have the importance worldwide of a pimple on an elephant's behind. Mm. Uh, they are, while they're important to your <laughs> listeners and they're important to me, they don't matter in terms of the global economy. There's lots of room for both of them. The enemy, if that's the right phrase, the competitor for gold in terms at least of the fondness of developed nation investors 
is probably the S&P 500 around the speculative fringes, uh, around that group for whom a $13 trillion market capitalization in a $650 trillion market cap world is important. Certainly there is a fight for the imagination, but that fight I think is more fiction than fact. <clears throat> and thank you for that horrific visual, by the way, of the elephant, left, <laughs> which I cannot get out of my mind now. But anyhow, Rick, um, I want to bring it home with something that really resonated in our last talk with the folks at home, where you said cash will be vital. Cash will be vital uh, during the days of, of, of dramatic reckoning. And that really struck a chord for a lot of folks, because like I said, I've had the other experts on saying you don't want to be in cash. Um, so again, you're really taking a contrarian approach there. If you could just speak a little bit more to why it's important to hold cash. You know, Daniela, I'm looking at, at my own life uh, and my own investment career going back now almost 50 years. Uh, for one reason or another, uh, every 10 years, every 15 years, there's a major crisis in confidence uh, and a major liquidity crisis. Um, you know, look back to 1981, 1982, look further back than that to 1976, look to 1987, look to the tech wreck in 2000, look to 2008. There have been many circumstances where uh, there have been crises in confidence. Uh, and the consequence of that was that there was a liquidity squeeze. When markets don't have liquidity, markets fall and they fall irrationally. If you as an investor don't have liquidity, you get taken advantage of by that circumstance. You panic and you get forced to sell. If you have liquidity and if you have psychological courage, you take advantage of the situation. So you need to decide for yourself uh, whether you're going to be a profiteer or whether you're going to be a victim. Uh, I would suggest that being a profiteer is better than being a victim. Take yourself back, Daniela, to 2008, okay. uh, when I know that you were conscious of the markets and you were probably far enough along in your career that you actually had some resources, yes. too. Uh, the circumstance in 2008 was that people who had anticipated a potential period of illiquidity, irrespective of the origin, and had cash had the ability to take advantage of equity markets where the prices had fallen by 50 or 60% right. with no change in the underlying value of the assets. If you converted that to physical goods, it was as though you were in your absolute favorite department store or clothing store and everything on the shelves was marked off 60%. If you have the cash and the courage, it's an opportunity. If you don't, it's a catastrophe. Right. And I think that's an important point to be made. It just gets muddled or confused with another discourse of, <clears throat> well, the US dollar is dying, it's no longer gonna be the reserve currency of the world, whatever that is. It's a completely different uh, thought process here. I think that's correct. Ir irrespective of the medium of exchange that you think will survive. Exactly. The idea is that if you have liquidity in a world that goes illiquid for a while, right. you either uh, come out of it in very fine shape or you come out of it in very poor shape. I like to tell my former clients, you know, now that I'm a retired gentleman, uh, a man of leisure, uh, I, I like to tell my former clients that, yes, when you hold cash, your purchasing power is deteriorating. It's deteriorating quarterly. Uh, but the deterioration in purchasing power, I would suggest, is an option payment. Because in a circumstance where you have a liquidity crisis, a, a confidence crisis, the opportunities that are available to you if you have the cash or the courage are spectacular. It's happened at least four times in my career now, and I'm uh, confident that it will happen at least one more time. All right, good thoughts uh, from you, Rick. You know, I always like ending uh, with Rick Rule's rules of wisdom, words of wisdom. <laughs> so the folks back at home, I know you always invite them. Uh, you're, you're, you're grading their, their stock picks. Uh, I do. You, you give a lot of education out there. Any just, you know, thoughts for our viewers out there, Rick? Bring it home. Well, uh, the thoughts are that don't pay, I think in the words of Wayne Gretzky, don't skate to where the puck is. Uh, 
for those of you who aren't Canadian, Wayne Gretzky was a great <laughs> hockey player. Oh gosh, I hope we don't have to explain that. But <laughs> okay. Know, but, the, but the idea okay. is that you skate to where the puck is. There's right. a bunch of mean guys swinging sticks. Right. That's the way capital markets are. Skate to where you think the puck is going to go. As an example, uh, I think deferred sustaining capital investments means that resources go broadly higher over the next five years because of shortages. Is it that way? No. Now? No. But it's going to be there. Uh, cash is trash. I don't think so. Uh, I think you have to have cash because I think sometime in the next five years, there's going to be a liquidity crisis. Uh, be a contrarian or you're going to be a victim. As to the offer, as you know, I love to make the offer. I love corresponding uh, with your listeners. Anybody who cares about what I have to say around their portfolio, at least their natural resources portfolio, is invited to go to a website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Enter your natural resource stocks. Please, Daniela, no crypto. Yes. Please, no, no, no technology cannabis, stocks. Right. Yeah, no cannabis. Natural resource stocks. I'll rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I'll comment on individual issues that I think might have value. There In addition, yeah. uh, I'll include a copy of the Barron's Gold Mining Index for people who care about gold stocks. And for people who care about commodities in general, and everybody should for the next five years, I'll include a hundred year commodity chart that talks about the prices of commodities relative to other asset classes going back a hundred years. Sounds good to me. Do I get a cup of coffee with that too? <laughs> Daniela, at some point in time, you and I will see each other. I, I will buy you a cup, a cup of cup of coffee or a cup of bourbon or whatever it is that your heart desires. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Rick Rule, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you soon. My pleasure. Looking forward to that. Me too. And thank you all for watching. We'll have much more for you on Stansberry Investor. So be sure to stay tuned. In the meantime, that's it for me. Thanks for watching.